Hello, everybody. My name is Dan Kilbride. I am the chair of the history department at John Carroll University outside of Cleveland, Ohio, and I'm the host of New Books in American Studies. What that means is every week or so, I find a book, or sometimes a book finds me, that interests me in the field of American studies. And American studies could mean history, as it usually does on this show, uh, political science, public health, medicine, culture, literature, practically everything. And we sit down and speak to the author about this book for about an hour. Today, we are joined by Simon P. Newman. He is the Sir Dennis Brogan Professor of American History at the University of Glasgow. Uh, Simon and I go back to uh, what is now called the McNeil Center of American Studies, but back in the day, it was called the Philadelphia Center for American Studies. They have something like, what, 50 fellows now, Simon? I think there were four That's right. when, uh, when we were there uh, back, in, back, back in the mid-90s. So um, we're going to discuss Simon's book today, A New World of Labor, The Development of Plantation Slavery in the British Atlantic, which is published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2013. Uh, this book intersects two uh, really exciting uh, historical literatures, one of which was the development of African slavery. The other is what listeners – to, uh, to this show might know as Atlantic history. Now, about two weeks ago, uh, we interviewed John Thornton about his book, A Cultural History of the Atlantic World. And, and, and this is a really exciting field of historical literature. Uh, many of our listeners who think they know a lot about American history and the development of slavery in the United States might be very surprised by this book. Because it doesn't deal with what ma many American audiences may feel are the appropriate subjects, such as South Carolina or Virginia. Uh, the book focuses on uh, the, the tiny little leeward island of Barbados sticking out into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and it is a very exciting uh, work on the development of African slavery in the British Atlantic. So Simon Newman, welcome to New Books in American Studies. Thank you. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I've been teaching here at the University of Glasgow since 1997, but before that, I taught at Northern Illinois University outside Chicago for six years. I did my postgraduate work, my graduate work in the U.S. at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and then at Princeton, and uh, I was at the McNeil Center, the Philadelphia Center, as was, uh, working on my first book when I met you um, more years ago than I think either of us care to remember. So I've yep, been that's for sure. taught on, uh, educated on both sides of the Atlantic and worked on both sides of the Atlantic. And that's really informed this sort of Atlantic perspective I have in, in this book. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think we should get uh, a, a big question out of the way right away. And that is, um, why Barbados? Uh, just tell our listeners, you know, what happened on Barbados that so influenced the development of uh, plantation colonies elsewhere in the Americas? That's the $64,000 question. And yep. uh, I really didn't know this until I started the research for this book. Uh, but in the, we all tend to look at Virginia and Maryland, the Chesapeake colonies is where slavery starts in the US in the colonial period. And in some ways that's true. But at the same time, uh, Barbados is very small island, 166 square miles. So it's very, very, very small, uh, is actually where all the action is taking place. Um, for in the, the 17th century, for every one slave who sets foot in the Chesapeake colonies, 15 disembark in Barbados. So mm -hmm. that's where the, the English first and then later the British are figuring out how to make slavery work. Uh, one of the things you do in this it, it, early in the book is to distinguish between different kinds of bound labor. You know, many uh, Americans uh, and other people who are listening uh, will be cert will be familiar with, for example, you know, indentured servitude. Uh, but one of the things you do is is you argue that you know our understanding of different kinds of bound labor, which whether it's slavery or servitude, is it tends to be very static. And one of the things you try to do is to broaden our concept of what slavery was and give us sort of an understanding of the spectrum of different sorts of bound labor. Can you just review that a little bit? Yes, of course. What I realized as I, as I got deeper into this project was that I, I needed to work on the early modern British Isles, early modern West Africa, and the early modern Caribbean in order to make sense of the slavery that ends up in the U.S., 
uh, and I'll, I'll explain that a little, that the people, the white colonists who come over from the British Isles bring with them ideas about how labor should be organized. And a lot of labor in the British Isles at, at the, this time, in the 1500s and 1600s, was by our standards bound. People were servants in husbandry quite often. These would be young people from their mid, sort of mid-teens onwards who would sign themselves over to work for a year at a time for a farmer and they'd be learning farming skills, they'd be paid a small amount at the end of the year having been given full board. But during that time, they were legally bound to work for that farmer. And this was a way that had developed in England to control a population that was often too large and they didn't want uh, to have people just only working for as much time as they needed to and being potentially, as far as the authorities were concerned, troublemakers. So the English and the British were very well used to controlling, binding labor like that. And then when the population grew really large and there was the potential for that there was not enough work, and then also when there are periods of war, the English proved very willing to go even further in controlling that labor. And they passed very strong laws against vagrants, people who are unemployed, uh, for example, and the Vagrancy Act that's passed during Henry VIII's parliament actually mandates slavery for people who are caught um, being vagrants more than once. Oh, wow. So uh, that's in 1547. And it, and it says uh, they will be slaves for two years. And if they run away during that period, they'll be enslaved for life. Hmm. Now, the law doesn't last. Clearly, it, it's not. It's going a step too far. But it shows that they're thinking in these terms. Right. Then when the English get to West Africa, they they encounter African slavery, of course. But African slavery and the way it works in Africa is very different from what you and I are, are familiar with later in America. Mm -hmm. And so the English have to accommodate that. In order to be able to function on the west coast of Africa, where they're trading first for gold and ivory and then eventually for slaves, they need West African labor. So if you'd visited the headquarters of British trade in West Africa in the late 1600s throughout the 1700s, Cape Coast Castle, which is today in Ghana, Mm -hmm. you would have found most of the workforce in that castle, most of the, the British employees were African slaves owned by the British. But they worked in a West African way. So they're paid. They can choose their own families. They will not be sold and, and sent across the Atlantic to the New World. The kind of goods they're paid in, uh, trade goods, could even include weapons. So you're actually paying slaves with gunpowder and guns knives, things like that, which shows this is not slavery as we know it. You can't imagine a, a planter in South Carolina or Virginia paying their slaves at all. And you <laughs> certainly can't pay, imagine them paying them with weapons. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> it just shows that the English, once they're there, they recognize that they have to accommodate local labor forms, which makes sense. But they bring over white labor and they treat the white labor terribly. And mo many of those white laborers <laughs> die. So you've, I, th when I was sitting in the archives in, in London, looking at this, I was really scratching my head because as an American historian, this didn't make sense to me. I didn't understand what was going on. And then I followed it through to Barbados because that's the important colony in the 17th century. That's where all the money is being made once they mm -hmm. shift to sugar in the 1640s and 50s. If you ask anyone in, in England, what's the most important colony? They'd have all said Barbados. Right. And initially... What they're doing there is using white bound labor from the British Isles. And I think what happens is this is a really interesting period in the 1620s, 30s and 40s. Uh, for those people who don't know what's going on in the British Isles at that point, it's what's called the War of the Three Kingdoms or the English Civil War, where the King Charles I is fighting in England for his crown. And he's fighting in Scotland and Ireland as well. And he loses it. He loses his head. Uh, in the protectorate. And so there are these massive wars going on. What that creates uh, is, is a situation where what's going on in the colonies is largely ignored in London. They just, mm -hmm. they can't focus on that. And at the same time, they're, they're capturing many people, many prisoners of war. And when, for example, Cromwell, after the king has been executed, goes into Scotland, and then he goes over to Ireland, he is capturing many, many people. When he sacks Drogheda outside Dublin, uh, Drogheda doesn't means Cromwell can kill every person within Drogheda. Well, he kills mm. most of them, but he doesn't kill <laughs> all of them. And those he doesn't kill, he sends to Barbados. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are bound laborers. So as well as vagrants 
people who are unemployed in Britain. They're emptying the prisons in England and Scotland, sending them to Barbados, and then these prisoners of war. And they're often bound for periods of up to 10 years. Mm. Well, life expectancy in Barbados at that time is about two to three years. Yeah. So you've immediately created a system where it's okay for these planters to work people to death. That's effectively what they're doing. And the English government isn't really keeping an eye on the situation. And these planters have absolute power. They control the assembly, they control the courts, they control the governor, they control the military, they control everything. So you are giving uh, people a power they never dreamed of having back in England mm. over their workforce. But they're using it first against white people. And it's only when that supply of white people begins to diminish and get too expensive, and when the English government wakes up to what's happening, uh, that they begin to think about changing. Mm. Uh, regarding these bound laborers in in the British Isles, uh, what kind of treatment could uh, a, you know a young man or a young woman who's bound out to a, a, a wealthy farmer? What kind of treatment could they expect from that person? What kind of legal rights, if any, did they enjoy to protect themselves? That that's a good question. There there are legal protections. Uh, it's a contract uh, it, that usually an oral contract, but sometimes the written one that's signed. Mm. So, and it's for a year. So if you, if a, a farmer has maybe four or five people who are bound to work for him, uh, if he treats them badly, they're not going to come back the next year. And if he gets a reputation as being mm. too harsh, a taskmaster, um, other people are not going to want to work for him. So there is some protection and there are cases where bound laborers will go to court and say, this farmer has not kept to the terms of, of his agreement with me. He's been too abusive or whatever. So there are protections. But on the other hand, the courts tend to side with the masters a lot. And these contracts do give them powers of corporal punishment. So they can physically punish um, and chastise their servants. And they, mm -hmm. do. they can even ask the courts to do it for them if they can prove that the it, it's it's a legitimate punishment. So mm. it's a balance. Uh, it's nothing like slavery, but it's not free labor as we know it either. Right. right. Uh, well, one thing you discuss is that you argue that uh, during the era that where Barbados was being settled, concepts of labor and servitude and even unemployment were changing in England. Uh, how were those and, and why were those concepts changing? I think they were changing for a couple of reasons. Uh, you have, really have to go back into the medieval period for the, the social uh, context for this, that during the, the period of the bubonic plague, uh, um, the, the, the plague, the Black Death, in the 14th century, the population of the British Isles had plummeted. The population of Europe had plummeted, uh, which created an unusual situation. There were, was a lot of land and not many people. And that's when these laws first develop, because landowners think, well, with not much land, uh, with not much population and lots of land, why will mm -hmm. people come and work for us? So if you're a large landowner who depends on labor, you could potentially be in big trouble. So these laws are passed to mandate and make sure that young people will come and work for large landowners. Then the situation begins to change in the 1400s and the 1500s as the population rebounds, and not only rebounds, increases beyond its, its pre-plague levels, while at the same time, these large landowners have decided they can make more money from sheep than from grain farming. Mm -hmm. So this is the period of enclosures. They are enclosing land, their own land and sometimes public land, and putting it out to pasture for sheep. But that means less and less farmland, which means less and less work for farm laborers. So you get rising unemployment, rising vagrancy, um, uh, more and more people who are unemployed and off the land. And that's what terrifies the authorities. Mm. One of the things that distinguishes this book written today from a book that would have been written maybe as long as you know, 10, 15 years ago is that this book spends a lot of time in Africa. Uh, it spends a lot of time on the Gold Coast specifically. And I wondered if you could talk about, first of all, to our readers who don't know very much about African history in this era, uh, why you spend so much time on the Gold Coast, what is so important about the Gold Coast, and leading to the, the question about you know, how the British used bound labor 
on their in their establishments on the Gold Coast? Yes, well, like uh, some of your listeners, a few years ago, I knew virtually nothing about African history and West African history. Uh, and it was only through this project that I began to realize what was going on there and how interesting and important it was. Uh, it's... The English get interested in Africa long after the Portuguese and the Danes and um, other European powers had been there. The Portuguese are there in the 1400s, uh, small boats going down the African coast. They get interested quickly because particularly along the area called the Gold Coast, which is today Ghana, Benin, um, as the name suggests, uh, there's a lot of gold production there um, by the early well, late 1600s, early 1700s, a significant portion of the gold that's circulating in Europe is coming from the Gold Coast. You know, we tend to think of Spain and Mexico and these places as producing a lot of gold. By then, that's gone. The gold is coming from Africa. Mm. Uh, so that's what attracts them to begin with. Uh, and the English are late in on the game. Once they get there, they want gold too. But there is also ivory and spices. This is an age when ocean-going sailing is improving massively. And also they're going there because quite often it's the easiest way to get to the bits of the Americas they want to. The ocean currents are their friends. Mm -hmm. And so you sail maybe to the Canary Islands uh, or Madeira, out a little way into the Atlantic off the African coast, and then the currents will take you down the African coast. And then when you leave the African coast, the currents will take you straight over to Barbados, the Caribbean, and the American South. So that's what's bringing them to Africa, the hope of trade. And it's often the way that they'll get to the Americas. It's interesting for me because once that happens, they begin to establish permanent settlements. And I had always thought of this in terms of colonization, just like the English are colonizing America. I thought they were establishing little colonies on the African coast and imposing their power. And what I realized very quickly is exactly the reverse was true. The English, the Dutch, the French, anyone who has settlements on the West African coast has virtually no power. They are there because they're tolerated by a very powerful, very old African civilization. Um, if you visited the biggest, the two biggest establishments, the Cape Coast Castle, the English one, and within sight of it, Elmina Castle, which is the Dutch headquarters, mm -hmm. um, they're very close together. They're still there, massive castles with these huge dungeons built underneath them to hold the slaves. Um, at, at their height, you wouldn't have had more than 100 white people in either one. And within a couple of hundred miles of them are many hundreds of thousands of Africans. So who's in charge here? Uh, very clearly, when you visit the castles, all of the cannon are pointing out to sea. They right. know they can't defend themselves against the local Africans. They wouldn't, need, they wouldn't have a chance. Those are to protect them against other European countries attacking them. Right. And a significant number of those Europeans in those forts are deathly ill. Exactly. The, uh, the, <laughs> the English call it uh, the white man's grave. The white man's, man's graveyard. Grave, right. You think it's on, I mean, you and I know how unhealthy the early Chesapeake, Virginia and, and uh, Maryland, and then later the Carolinas would be for white people. It's nothing compared to the Gold Coast. Because if you're born on the Gold Coast as an African or in those areas, if you will almost certainly have been exposed to things like malaria and yellow fever as a child. And it will kill plenty of African children. Mm -hmm. But if you survive that, it means you've got a degree of immunity. So a young West African, late teens, 20s, may well get sick uh, from a variety of diseases, including yellow fever and malaria, but it's unlikely to kill them. The Europeans who come, they, ha they don't have a chance. So not just the ones who are stationed there, but the crews who come down on ships to trade, because a, a ship trading will often be off the West African coast for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. um, they do everything they can to stop the sailors going ashore and to try and establish some kind of quarantine, but they usually fail. Um, so quite often a ship will get down there with a crew of 30 or 40 and leave with a crew of a dozen. So it's... Uh, they need labor all the time to make these operations work. They are constantly trying. They, they have company headquarters in London. The Royal African Company is the most famous mm -hmm. one, but it goes through various incarnations. It only survives through government help and government subsidy because they can't make it work. People are dying all the time. 
so because they don't have these, you know, you, you can't get European laborers there and you can't get them to survive. They're dependent on local African labor. Mm-hmm. So as, as you mentioned earlier, and I, I hope you can elaborate on this, uh, the bound labor that Europeans use in these Gold Coast castles differs completely from the kind of plantation mm-hmm. regimen they establish in Barbados and later on in Virginia and South Carolina. Can you talk about how the kind of bound labor that Europeans use in the Gold Coast, how did it work? What, what kind of labor would Africans do? What kind of protections and security did they enjoy? Right. They, they do a wide variety of things. The, the first thing to note is that the, the English are very clever in that they decide to buy slaves in, in the Gambia and then transport them down to the Gold Coast and use them in the Gold Coast. That means there are um, at least a thousand miles from home. So it would be mm-hmm. like taking someone from Scotland to southern Italy. Different languages, different culture, different religion. Uh, why do they do that? Those people aren't going to run away. If they run away from the British or the English, their, their masters, they're going to run straight into an African com- uh, countryside where they're complete strangers, where people are well used to capturing slave- uh, strangers and selling them into slavery. So they do that to begin with. So very few of these slaves run away. But they also don't run away because they actually have a pretty good life. Slavery is very common as a labor form in West Africa. If you get into debt, you might sell yourself or one of your family members into slavery. Um, There are all kinds of reasons why one might become a slave. If a woman becomes a slave and she then marries her master, um, She's, she may still technically be a slave, but in, to all intents and purposes, she's left the state of slavery and her children mm-hmm. are slaves. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of polygamy in, in West Africa. So quite often there'll be a farmer, a man with four or five wives in separate households around um, at the area they farm. And several of them might be slave women and several might not be. Uh, it, it's a very fluid system. You walk through an African community and you probably can't tell who's a slave and who's free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's an important thing as background. The British realize how this system works, but they also then adapt it because their needs are a bit different. What do they need in these castles? The first thing they need to do is keep the castle standing. Uh, It's a very corrosive atmosphere, a a high salt content in the air because of the crashing surf. So concrete, metal, wood, it all corrodes all the time. And... They start to train these slaves in this brief period of white craftsmen and white servants are are alive. They train them. So they teach them how to make bricks. They teach them all of the skills and crafts of the British as as well as using local West African crafts. And so after a while, you've got a very skilled group of African slaves who are then training their sons and daughters and new slaves in this kind of labor. So they're keeping the castle standing. They're also looking after the enslaved Africans who've been purchased, who are going to be put on ships and sent across the Atlantic. Some of them are also soldiers um, protecting the castle when necessary. And again, that's common in West Africa. Some of the big armies are largely enslaved. uh, So that would not be unusual. Mm -hmm. Um, The women tend to work in less skilled occupations. They call them laboresses. And they're often assisting the male craftsmen. They're keeping the castle clean. They're probably cleaning the slave dungeons, things like that. Um, And there's a little bit of food production, too. So those Mm -hmm. are the kinds of activities the slaves are doing. Right. Let's turn to the Americas and look at Barbados. And as you mentioned, Barbados, if, if somebody is coming at this subject not knowing much about it, Barbados would not probably be the first place that they would pick to you know, see the establishment of, of, of plantation slavery in this gigantic economic engine. But it, it is that. As you said, if the British had to choose between, say, you know, Virginia, which is how many times of magnitude larger than Barbados or Barbados, they would clearly have chosen Barbados. Uh, just as a, as a wealth generator, how did Barbados become this commercial giant of the 17th century British Empire? And just how dynamic and innovative was its economy? Well, it, it became this, I think, because of geography. 
Uh, it's a little island, as you say, it's the furthest island out into the Atlantic, the most remote of the islands. And the Spanish, I mean, they, they set foot on it, but they thought, well, this is useless. It's small, it's heavily <laughs> forested. We can't do anything with this. And they just left it alone. It had in the past been inhabited at times by indigenous people, but they, they never established permanent settlements there. No one had been mm -hmm. living there for a while. No one saw any potential in this. The English establish a permanent settlement in 1627. The first thing they do with these bound white laborers is, is clear the land as best they can to farm it. And they try, just like in the Chesapeake, they try everything. They try uh, tobacco, but the tobacco they grow isn't very good. A mm -hmm. um, couple of other crops, inc including cotton. But think about where they are geographically. They're very close to Brazil. And Dutch uh, settlers in Brazil who have mastered the uh, growing and then of sugar and then its production, because you don't just grow sugar cane, you then have to have a semi-industrial process quick right. on the plantation to turn that sugar cane into sugar. Because if you, you couldn't just ship sugar cane back to the British Isles, it would rot. Uh, it would be useless within a couple of weeks. So the Dutch have this skill and they come over with some slaves to Barbados and very quickly the English start to develop this. And it is remarkably fast, um, not just how quickly they adopt it, but how quickly they learn this technology. So that by the end of the 1600s, Barbados is covered by windmills and an animal powered mills to grind this sugar. Uh, they've learned how to plant this. They've learned how to process it. Uh, and what sugar will need is a huge workforce. Uh, why does sugar need such a large workforce? I mean, uh, you know, American audiences are probably used to thinking about you know tobacco production, cotton production, which are not necessarily economies of scale. Mm -hmm. But sugar, as you said, is an economy of scale. It, it, these plantations are much larger on average than American plantations of the 19th century and the 18th century. And as you said, they're also semi-industrial. Mm -hmm. um, well, you, what, go on. You, you need this large workforce because of what's required to plant and then tend the crop. Um, Sugarcane, because of the, the, the nature of the environment in the, in the Caribbean, weeds grow incredibly fast. <laughs> so you really can't leave a, a field of sugarcane for more than two days without hoeing it. Because otherwise, young sugarcane plants and even... Um, stronger and larger sugarcane plants will be surrounded and effectively strangled by weeds. So it needs constant attention. It also needs to be pruned back to allow it to develop properly. Very quickly, they're going to exhaust the soil. It's a small island. It's very fertile, but you, you, just, you can't grow constantly without doing real damage to the ecosystem, which they do, mm -hmm. which means they have to then replenish it. Um, this becomes the most hated work of the enslaved workforce, which is uh, manuring, where they produce huge quantities of manure and then put that in when they plant the cane and then constantly manure and fertilize it thereafter. If, Even worse than working in the sugar mill. I'm sorry? Even more hated than working in the mill yes. itself? Yes. This is, uh, they're carrying on their heads these large baskets of animal and human manure. Well, I can see the point. Yeah. Then. It's not a pleasant job. They hate this job. <laughs> Um, so that's incredible work. And then when you have the, the harvest season, which will last probably two to three months, yeah. um, they are harvesting this and you have to then very quickly get the, sh the lengthy pieces of sugar cane that you've cut to the mill. You uh, have to run them through the mill several times to extract as much juice as possible. And then that juice will run down into the boiling rooms where it will be boiled um, and you ladle off the scum that rises to the top, and then you, as it boils down, you ladle it into another smaller boiling pan, and you do that six times over a period of a couple of days. Mm -hmm. um, these sugar mills will work around the clock six days a week, and the, the enslaved will be essentially uh, split into two workforces who will work 12-hour shifts. Uh, the, the reason that the, the image of the zombie the walking dead arises in the Caribbean first is because of this work. Rate. Uh -huh. hmm. That's where it comes from. Uh, the people who have not had enough sleep and are working this incredibly hard physical labor 
for a period of months. Um, this is where a lot of the injuries will happen. Yeah, sure. People who are falling asleep on their feet, often young people who are feeding the cane into the, uh, the sugar mills will not let go in time and their arms will be drawn into the mills. There's always a hatchet there to cut the, the arm off because it's the only way you can save them. Mm -hmm. um, this sort of thing. People will fall into or be burned in the, in the sugar boiling. Um, some of the molasses will be used to make uh, rum. That's a potentially very dangerous process too. Uh, so this is, this is why it needs so much labor. And the other reason they need so much labor is that especially in the 1600s and the first half of the 1700s, uh, just like the white labor force before them, the enslaved Africans are dying faster than they're born. Yeah. And, uh, you know, after a while, I mean, the Royal African Company proved unable to meet the needs of uh, the, the planters on Barbados. Uh, how many of, of the slaves uh, coming to Barbados, did the majority of them come on British ships or were the planters not very picky about where they got their slaves? They're not very picky, but the majority do come on British ships. Um, in the, the 1700s, the British become the masters of this trade. They're doing mm -hmm. more of it than anyone else. So for that reason alone, most of these are going to come on, on British ships. But they do buy um, from French and Dutch and others too. They tend to like buying from the British because of the personal connections and the trade connections and because they begin to develop uh, the planters' preferences for where the slaves come from. And the, the funny thing is this emulates what they've done with British laborers, laborers uh, beforehand, they preferred mm -hmm. Scottish laborers to Irish. They hated Irish laborers. This is an age of <laughs> horrible ethnocentrism and religious bigotry. And they really thought of the Irish as semi-human. Um, they develop similar preferences and they love Gold Coast. They love African slaves from the Gold Coast. That's who they like. They, view, they actually view them as very proud and potentially rebellious. And they were right. That's exactly what happens with that Gold Coast uh, slaves in Jamaica, they do become rebellious, but they also thought they were very strong and good workers. Mm -hmm. So they they develop these preferences, and they're getting many of these slaves from British ships. Yeah, I don't want to get, I don't want to drill down too deeply into the specialized historical literature here, but there is uh, you know, a, a, a literature out there that uh, debates the extent to which historians can actually identify the ethnic origins of African slaves. Uh, and one of the difficulties in, in doing that is, well, there's many, there are many difficulties, but one of them is the unreliability of European knowledge about Africa in this period, which was pretty dismal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Europeans, including slave traders, uh, Try to identify you know, the ethnic origins of Africans. Uh, you know, they threw around terms like you know Mandingos and Gullahs and Ebos and things like this. And for example, Ebos had a reputation for committing suicide, at least according to Europeans. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, these these planters have a preference for Gold Coast slaves. How well do you think that preference was rooted in what you might call sort of an objective understanding about? actual ethnic differences between or cultural differences between different African peoples? That's a really interesting, interesting subject. I think initially they're fairly ignorant, but over time they become more and more knowledgeable because mm. uh, we tend to, th we don't think enough about creolization in the Caribbean, uh, us American historians, and, and what an African process that was that if you read the journals and diaries of white planters, the few who've left us really detailed records in the Caribbean, they're learning a lot about Africa. They're learning African words, they're learning African phrases, they're learning African belief systems, dances, music, all kinds of things. And many of them are quite interested. They observe. And so if they buy, uh, they think that they have a few Gold Coast slaves on their plantation and they like them and then they go to a ship and they buy some more and those new slaves are immediately able to talk to the old Gold Coast slaves and have things in common, then you think, yeah, they've come from the same region. Mm -hmm. So there's some objective knowledge in this. 
But at the same time, we use, as you know, there's this wonderful resource called the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database, where historians yes. have put all of this fantastic information together. But what they're really recording is point of departure. Right. They're saying, these, this ship left from the Gold Coast, therefore those are Gold Coast slaves. Well, that's like saying a ship that leaves from uh, Liverpool going to America in the 1800s only has people from the Liverpool region in it. Right. Um, whereas people could have come from as far away as Germany to get onto that ship to go to America. So there are problems there. One of the most interesting, I know you don't want to get into the specialist literature, but I, I, in a project I've done aside from this book, I've worked with some uh, medical specialists here at the University of Glasgow, DNA specialists. And we did a project on, on Jamaica and looked at some of the maroon communities there and compared their DNA, their uh, matrilineal DNA, DNA, with West Africa. And we found that many of them had come from the Gold Coast. Oh, wow. So very you, you can do things with DNA. This would be very difficult to do in the U.S. because the African-American population in the U.S. has moved around so much and intermarried so much mm -hmm. that the DNA, African DNA, has gotten very confused. But mm -hmm. in, of course, an island like Jamaica or um, Barbados, that's much less true. Right. I don't, I don't know if you can address this question with much confidence or authority, but to what extent, if at all, could planters in Barbados and other you know, high demand and therefore you know, expensive plantation colonies exercise some control? over the supply of slaves they were getting from Africa. So you know, they, they want slaves from the Gold Coast. Maybe they prefer them. To what extent can they tell slave ship captains that, you know, I, I want you to get me slaves from the Gold Coast? Or do they simply have to accept what ships deliver? It's a bit of both. Um, historians have argued about this a lot. If, if you don't have enough slaves and your plantation is suffering, you'll buy whoever is available. Mm -hmm. But... The Royal African Company has agents in Barbados. There's word going backwards and forwards all the time that they can express preferences. And where the Barbados planters are fortunate in a way is when you sail from West Africa, the chances are the very first land you're going to see is Barbados. It's just where the currents take you. So a lot of these ships will go to Barbados first. And quite often those planters will get the pick of who they want. And they may buy an entire contingent and then sell some of them on. They may say, well, we're going to keep these slaves, but we're going to sell these ones on to other islands. So right. depending, I, I think the Barbados planters do get to exercise quite a lot of choice here. But if there's a, a lean year and they're having to get all the slaves from Gambia that year, they'll still buy Gambia slaves. They'll buy whatever they need. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I've actually gotten a little bit ahead of the, the arc of the book here because we, we've sort of leapt to, to discussing... African slavery, but of course, you know the first laborers on Barbados, including on the uh, burgeoning sugar plantations there, were in fact bound laborers from Great Britain. Mm -hmm. um, what was the experience of uh, you know, European bound laborers in Barbados, and how did their experience differ from that of similar groups of bound laborers elsewhere in the New World? Their, their conditions are much worse. I, I don't really think there's anywhere else in the British Atlantic world where bound labor, white bound labor is treated so badly. And I think that's why such a vicious system of plantation slavery was able to develop there. Um, they, we do have some records of this, not least because a lot of the people coming over as bound laborers are prisoners of war. And some of them uh, will come home afterwards. They will, they will survive. And often they'll be the only one in a, from a whole ship or something like that, and they'll write about it. So especially during the English Civil War, the War of the Three Kingdoms, there are people who are really, really angry they've been treated this way. And if they survive, they're going to tell people about it. And so we have these written accounts of what it was like. We also have other examples. Um, so, for example, just in the, the surviving wills left by people on, in Barbados in the late 1600s, we have people who were clearly captured by Cromwell in Ireland, who then served for at least 10 years and miraculously survived. Wow. Uh, and then they're living in absolute poverty on Barbados. They don't have enough money to leave. They're living on little scraps of marginal land. They're perhaps being employed as militiamen or overseers of slaves, if that. And you know, someone is leaving a hammock, and that's all. 
And it's that sort of thing. They have nothing. Um, we also know a little bit because some of their descendants are still there. They're living on the western part of the island. They're, they've been known for over a century as the Red Legs. And they're the descendants of the Irish and Scottish prisoners who were bound laborers in the 1600s. And you talk to these people and they, just, they sound just like any other Barbadian, black, uh, usually. They sound just like them because they've been there in the same place for, for so many centuries. And they'll have names uh, like James Ferguson, you know, a good Scottish name. And you'll say, well, where did your family come from? And they'll say, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. They have no sense. They've lost all connection with where they came from. And they've been living uh, in poverty on the island for centuries. And those mm -hmm. are the, the remnants. Many of these people died. Mm -hmm. uh, let's t turn back to the Gold Coast for a bit um, and talk about the, the British laborers who are laboring there. Because, you know, as you pointed out, the communities of Europeans, not merely Britons on the African coast, are relatively small because of its you know, well-deserved and well-publicized reputation for being a white man's grave. Nevertheless, there are communities of Europeans, some of them fairly long-term, the lucky ones, you know, working in these castles. How did Europeans and, and Englishmen in particular cope with conditions on the Gold Coast? And what kind of opportunities did they have and exploit for commercial success and other kinds of opportunities on the Gold Coast? If it's, it's a lottery. If you survive, you can do very, very well on the Gold Coast. Um, tr primarily not on your salary. Uh, the very top officials like the governor and people like that are fairly well paid. But most of the others aren't. It's trading on your own account so that you will uh, be able to buy or bring in trade goods of your own from the British Isles and then trade them on the West African coast. Uh, that's how you can make money. So you also will have opportunities because everyone's dying. So there really are several cases of people coming over as a clerk, you know, an 18 year old who is, has some training in literacy and mathematics and bookkeeping and is coming over to keep trading records. And 10 years later, he's the governor. You know, he's gone up <laughs> about 15 ranks. And it's mm -hmm. simply because he's good, he survived, and everyone else has died. So yeah. this does happen. So you, I, I can see the attraction, but it is the, the diseases they're facing are just terrible. Right. Um, many of them will, from the local West African population or from um, the enslaved population, take black mistresses. And so there's a growing mulatto population. And they do, uh, some of them appear to, to get quite integrated into local, uh, these white men get quite integrated into local West African society. And they even live outside of the castles in the West African communities. Over time, they'll develop schools for the mulatto children and try and, and educate them in English. Some, some of these men will send their mulatto children back to the British Isles to be educated. So the first uh, black minister ordained by the Church of England will, will come from that community and then will go back and be the black minister at, at Cape Coast Castle in the middle of the 18th mm -hmm. century. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's been a, a, a substantial attention to some of the people you've just described, or these you know, mulatto children of uh, British and other European men and local African women. And sometimes these people are called Atlantic Creoles. Mm -hmm in the historical literature, how important were they on the Gold Coast as, uh, as middlemen uh, in between Africans and Europeans or as actors you know, unto themselves? They are, they are quite important, but they're not the most important middlemen, interestingly. Uh, if you think about this from the perspective of the, the West African communities as the Europeans begin to arrive, before the Europeans had arrived, these West African communities were on the edge of their world. The Africans were very good fishermen, but they weren't good deep sea sailors, mm -hmm. not yet. And that means this is the edge of their world. So if you're buying trade goods, things like that, they've come all the way across the Sahara or from deep in Central Africa. Uh, the Europeans don't bring much that's new, but they, they bring it much more easily than it would have been available before. So you've got these communities, large populations who suddenly realize we could be the middle of everything. We could now become the trade middlemen between Europe and Africa. And that means there's opportunity. 
So local rulers will often uh, try and appoint themselves or a son or a, a chosen person to be the broker between the Europeans and the Africans. Hmm. Um, and these are very powerful, very influential people. So although the mulatto, the, the Atlantic Creoles you talk about, can have that role on a local level, the big power brokers are West Africans. Hmm. Okay. Uh, we've been talking about bound laborers. We've been talking about Africans. How and why did white bound labor give way to African slavery in Barbados? That's another of those $64,000 questions. Uh, <laughs> and this is where I think my book goes out on a limb a bit and takes issue with some of the, the, the familiar American history, uh, mm -hmm. Troop Jordan and Edmund Morgan and people like that. Um, what I'm, I'm suggesting here is that it's not about race and racism. And that's not to say the English and the British weren't racist. They were. Yeah. Um, but that's not what's causing them to act the way they were. They proved more than willing, more than happy to use white labor, work white people to death. But by the middle of the 1600s, the 1650s, the, the transition to sugar is well underway. Um, once you get through that decade, England is beginning to pay a lot more attention to its colonies. At the same time, it's become very clear what a, it's a fate worse than death to be sent to Barbados. It's mm -hmm. even entered the English language. To be kidnapped and sent to Barbados is, is to be Barbadosed. Oh, it becomes a verb. <laughs> yeah, it becomes a verb. So people don't want to go there, and England's paying attention. That means labor becomes more expensive. At the same time, Scotland is being cut out of the English Empire with the Navigation Act. Scotland had been a great source for this white labor. That's no longer available. Mm -hmm. Net result is the white labor becomes much more expensive. And the English government is beginning to watch how you're treating that white labor. Also, you've brought over so many of them that even if only a minority survive, that minority is still growing. And this is an island of only 166 square miles. What are those people going to do? They're a potentially very troublesome force. At exactly the same time as the British and the English get more and more involved in trade in West Africa, the price of West African slaves is dropping. So I think it's an economic choice and a choice uh, that's made easy because they, it's becoming less convenient, less useful to use white bound labor. It's becoming much mm -hmm. more cost effective to use Africans. That's what I think is going on. Right. You, uh, you, again, I don't want to drill down too deeply into a pretty specialist literature, but you, you, you did, uh, raise the point that you, uh, you see this as a primarily an economic decision and you argue that, you know, the early development of the plantation system was not rooted in, uh, in a well-developed racial ideology. And certainly there's a literature out there. I'm thinking of David Eltis in particular, who has argued that, uh, there is an element, a strong element of race involved here. When you, when, as he argues, he, you, when you consider that Europeans never considered enslaving each other, uh, they would do terrible things to each other, especially on religious grounds, but they would not enslave each other, but they would enslave Africans. And so, you know, he and some other historians argue that there is a racial element here. And certainly it would surprise, you know, non-specialists who simply, you know, who assume for good reason that they, they make an equation between, uh, you know, new world slavery and racism. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you argue here that it is not rooted in racial ideology. To what extent did the, the British and, and the English look upon Africans and African slaves as different and maybe even inferior uh, in this era before the development of a fully-fledged you know, 19th century ideology of racism? Right. Well, it's interesting reading the accounts of the people on the West African coast, from the, the English people from the, the mid-1600s onwards. Uh, and we have a lot of records. If you visit the Royal African Company records, they're in the, the National Archives down in London. It's over 1,500 boxes and volumes of material, huge Oof. data, um, and a lot of letters coming back. And also ships captains will write diaries and journals. So we've got a lot of information about what they thought about the Africans. And there is certainly evidence of racism. They think the Africans are out to cheat them. They think the Africans can't be trusted. Uh, 
But to be honest, that's exactly what the Africans think about the Europeans. So mm -hmm. that's a two-way street. But there's also, you regularly see enormous respect for their, um, their ability as, as merchants and negotiators, their incredible skill and craftsmanship with gold, their ability to judge the quality of gold by rubbing gold dust in their fingers. You know, has this been mm. adulterated? In all kinds of ways, you often see the descriptions um, of their fishing, for example. And you think about fishing, what's that? But th these are people who, uh, many of the sailors who are going out there, they know all about fishing. They know about ocean fishing and they watch these Africans with awe and they marvel at their skill. So mm -hmm. there is actually a lot of respect for the Africans. There's also some racism. Uh, uh, this is not an enlightened age and I don't want to pretend the racism isn't there. All I yeah. want to say is it's not determining everything. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the crucial point here. Right. right. Uh, to what extent were African slaves on Barbados in the 17th and 18th centuries able to fashion some kind of structures, families, communities, churches, to enable them to sustain themselves or just to survive uh, within such a brutal system? Mm -hmm. As best we can tell, it's very, very hard in the 17th century. They're dying in large numbers. Uh, it's, it's very difficult for them to begin to progress. That only starts to happen in the 18th century. And even then, it's a, it's a painful and long process. But uh, I, I think this is partly, and again, economics rules everything. I don't think planters suddenly become more considerate. Uh, but as the land is exhausted and as Jamaica is rising, and becoming more and more the center of sugar production, Barbados planters realize they have to cut costs in order to be able to sell their sugar at a big profit. And they continue to do that all the way through the 1700s. They do that by realizing that they should give a bit of their land over to food production. And instead of importing all the food, cheap food to feed the slaves, allow the slaves to grow some of their own food make life healthier for the slaves. And as a result, this is amelioration, as it's called. By the 1770s, 1780s, more slaves are being born on Barbados every year than are uh, being imported. And more slaves are being born than, are, than die every year. It's a population that is replicating itself. Uh, and that makes a huge difference. Once that begins to happen, you get much more stable communities, much more stable family formation. Uh, they is a, the Church of England is trying to begin to educate the slaves in Christianity, but it's getting a lot of resistance from Barbados planters. That doesn't really begin to happen until the very end of the 18th century. But as best we can tell, there is, uh, I'd say from the, the middle of the 18th century onwards, we're seeing more and more of the creation of a stable culture, stable families. Up until that point, it's much more haphazard. Yeah, it sounds like, just life for uh, 17th century, early 18th century slaves on Barbados was just pretty grim. It, it was very grim. Um, and, and that lifestyle and that grim grimness is being exported. I mean, one of the reasons I think what I've done here is potentially important and interesting for people interested in American history is Barbados planters will then to move with their slaves to Jamaica to other islands in the Caribbean, but most importantly of all, as you well know from your earlier work, they moved to South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And that, that's my big argument here, I think, for American history, is that the kind of slavery that will spread throughout the Deep South from South Carolina has its origins much more in Barbados than it does in Virginia. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's important to remember that uh, and, and this is becoming, I think it's starting to penetrate textbooks and classrooms at least on this side of the Atlantic, is that you know the, the Virginia, South Carolina did not exist. You know they, they didn't sprout you know from the head of Athena. They they developed over a long time, and slave owners were very savvy people who knew what was going on in the wider Atlantic world. And you know uh, Barbados really came first in in, in, a, in a lot of ways, uh, and really showed the way for for a lot of these people. Even though sugar could not be cultivated on the mainland, right. uh, slavery was you know as we're coming to understand was a very, very flexible institution mm -hmm. and could be made to work in a variety of ways.
Well, we've taken up almost an hour of your time, and I know that you just published this book and you should be celebrating and all that stuff, but I have to ask, uh, what's next for you? I didn't know you were going to ask me that, <laughs> um, <laughs> it, but it's a, it's a good question. I think building from this project, I, I've become very interested in runaway slaves in the Atlantic world as a way of looking at how different slavery could be in different places at different times. What did people run away from? What did they run away to? So I'll give you one little example from Barbados, uh, this, this slave uh, called Johnny Beckles, who is found on a plantation. He'd run away at least 25 years before. Now, he hadn't run away to escape slavery. He hadn't run away from the island. He was on a different plantation. So you think, what does running away mean to him? Has he run away from a, a vicious master and gone to a kinder master? Has he run away to reunite with family members? You know, who knows what's going on there? But that, as I look at this, I think it's a very interesting way of showing how different slavery could be in different places at different times by looking at runaways. Right. So that's the project. Well, well I didn't mean to ambush you with a <laughs> question out of the blue, but that's this just an interesting question to wrap up this. And I know that what you've just finished a book, it's like, oh, I have no idea what I'm doing next, but you <laughs> seem to have a good idea. Well, uh, Simon, thank you so much for joining us and talking about this wonderful book. Uh, I want to urge our readers when they click on this interview, you will see a, uh, you'll see Simon's book there with a direct link to uh, its amazon.com page. And uh, let's give Simon some royalties. Uh, historians, don't usually get royalties, but when they come, they're very nice. And so, uh, you know, let's let's get them some some riches. Uh, thanks very much for joining us, Simon. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking with you. So once again, my name is Dan Kilbride, the host of New Books in American Studies, and we've been talking with Simon Newman in Glasgow about his new book, A New World of Labor: The Development of Plantation Slavery in the British Atlantic, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press. It's a great book. It's a great read. Go buy it. Uh, we'll see you again next week. Uh, this is once again Dan Kilbride, New Books in American Studies. So long. <laughs>